to Andrea to talk about trust with you. I've mentioned it a bit because I think that machine translation pushes us towards that aspect of the human to human relationship, which is a trust relationship. We have to get people to trust us. Why? Because they don't know the other language. That's why they come to a translator, in theory. Okay? It's a bit like people buying a used car. Have you ever bought a used car? Right. Did it go wrong? Did it break down? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, it looks great. That, ca that one doesn't, but anyway. Uh, we're not mechanics. We don't know what's under the bonnet. And this was an economic problem in the United States with the market for used cars. If you don't know what's there, how do you know what you're buying? So if the translator doesn't know the foreign language, how do they know the quality of the translation? How do they know whether to trust us? If there's no signaling, if there's no way of, you know, me or you or any other translator, you probably won't trust us. You'll accept the risk of the translation being bad or the motor is going to die after 2,000 kilometers, which has happened. So in a market where there's little trust, and this happened in the used car market, the price of the used cars dropped. And the more the price dropped, the worse the cars that came in to the market, to the point that nobody would buy a used car. There was no market. That is, if you had a car, a new car, you would keep it for longer because you wouldn't sell it because you couldn't get a good price. What happened? The good cars stayed out of the market, the bad cars came into the market, the price dropped, okay, to the point where there was no effective market. And that was where you were in the 1950s, mid-60s, in the United States for used cars. There was no market. It's called adverse selection. It's an economic problem where quality leaves the market because it can't get enough payment. You know what I'm talking about now? This happened in translation in the 1990s when uh, people started to use technologies, big companies came on board, there was a process of mergers, and they pushed the prices down that translators were getting paid. So good translators would leave and go and do other things, as I'm suggesting we should do now. Right. Now, the trick is that, that that's a model of market collapse, and it's very bad for everybody concerned. In the case of used cars, they solve the problem. If you go and buy a car now, usually anywhere in the world, okay, it's a lie model, uh, it'll have a sticker on it and it will be a certificate. And people are obliged, the seller is obliged to tell you exactly how many kilometers, what repair jobs have been done, what parts are new, everything that is known about the car is put on there and a guarantee is given. What does this do? It costs money to put in place. It's a certification system. It costs money to put in place, but you can sell the cars for a higher price. Therefore, people with new cars will sell their car earlier because they can get a good, good value for it and the buyer knows what they're getting. And so the price of the cars rises, good cars enter the market, and everybody is happy. To go from a situation of adverse selection, where quality leaves the market and the market collapses, to a situation of general trust, you require signaling. You require certification. That's why we have certification systems for translators, right? It's why you get a bit of paper when you finish your studies. That's why you get a certificate for coming here even. So anything that can show your quality improves your status in the market and ideally raises the price of what you can sell your services for and this is good for everybody concerned. Do you understand that? Okay. So that's why I'm interested in trust. Trust based on usually not personal knowledge, Thick trust, but thin knowledge, certification, uh, qualifications, your CV, your experience. Okay, thick and thin trust. Did Andrea do thick and thin trust with you? No? Okay. Thick trust is, is the mafia boss, I only trust my family. 
okay? Because they, I know everything they've done, I know everything about them. And thin trust is when I trust you because you are a qualified translator, all right? There's no doubt that, that the history of translation has moved from thick trust, the person who's, who's, who's known to everybody, to thin trust, where we operate as professionals. The movement is often due to technology. Often we don't see our clients. We operate via email or electronic means, or we're in one country, we have clients in another country. We are forced to move on the basis of thin trust, okay? Uh, now, I, I, I'm not even gonna go there, I'll stop there. My problem is this. According to some theorists, and Christina Abdallah, is, is the one I'm thinking of. She did her doctoral thesis on this. The more the translator-client relation becomes electronic, networked, the more complexity enters into it. You work for an agency who gives it to another agency, to another one. That is, the more it becomes networked, the more distance there, are, there is between people, both physical and, and social distance, the less trust there is the less people will trust the translator. And the less possibility there is to get a good price for what you're doing because of the market, okay? That is, greater risk in the electronic communications challenges trust, trust diminishes. And so her argument is the greater the risk of bad work because of our communications with clients the less possibility there is of trust, therefore of cooperation, therefore of a good, good payment, therefore of, 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 of producing quality work. Do you understand the problem? I think her argument is wrong, but I don't know. And my way of testing this is to look at case studies. Now all of you, I think, has anybody not worked as a translator ever here? Good, so everybody has a story to tell. Start thinking of a story that you can tell, <clears throat> a case that concerned trust or loss of trust. Perhaps if you're in a confessional mode, it's a case when somebody decided not to trust you, or you decided not to trust somebody, or a client betrayed you, or didn't pay you on time. No, they never pay on time. Didn't pay you what was promised, or something like that. Is that okay? Can you do that for me? All right, because I've got boring historical case studies. I'll just give you one to start off with, okay? It's a rather extreme one. Oh dear, look at all this, all this stuff we had here. Uh, ba -ba. Here we go, yeah. This is from a doctoral thesis on the history of translation in South Africa, and it's the first contact. Uh, abduction is the way that lots of language processes get started, and They've got uh, cocaine interpreters were taken from the lowest caste. So they had no alternative but to go on and learn Dutch, okay? Uh, they're actually the strandloper. These are people who lived as scavengers along the beaches in South Africa. And they were abducted. They learned Dutch remarkably quickly. And these were the interpreters uh, between the two social groups there, the Dutch speakers and the uh, koi koi speakers at the time, okay? What's going to happen? Is that going to work well as a regime, as a, a way of organizing translational exchanges? What do you think? Any guesses? Who trusts whom? Who, who's worthy of trust? Who's looking for trust? No one. Why not? Why is there no trust? Yes. Yeah, okay. Even after the first kidnapping, there were people who came in to this employee as, as interpreters voluntarily. Yeah, there's a problem there that the Khoi Khoi society didn't trust them because they're from the lower caste as well. They were okay with it because they gained some social prestige by coming working for the Dutch, Dutch settlers, all right? So they're all right with it. 
Did the Dutch trust them? What reason would they have to trust them? Did, could they check on them? No, because the Dutch were not interested in learning the language even. They, they have, you know, cultural attitude. Uh, so what happened, do you think? If we move on 50 years, you think these interpreters are still there working? Any guesses? I, I don't know if I've given you enough, if there's enough information there to sort of judge, but you move on 50 years, they were absolutely distrusted because they're from the other social group and we have no way of, of understanding or checking on their language, okay? And in some of them, uh, they were pre-literate and from the lower social caste, and was it, was it exiled? One was exiled to Robben Island, which is the island prison where Nelson Mandela was for many years. And the other one, his boss, Van Riebeck, wished he had never learned Dutch. This was complete, it's a historical model of adverse selection. This system, this regime of getting translational exchange going, failed miserably because they weren't trusted by the Dutch and they certainly weren't trusted by the other side, the Kokoi, because they were from the lower social caste. Okay, so there's a model, a case study of adverse selection. Use car, if you like. Do you see what I'm on about? Okay, I have other cases there. Does anyone want to volunteer a story? Yes, so come on, you've got to do it. You're bursting with experience and creativity and great ideas. Nobody, a story. Of, well, distrust, there would have to be an element of distrust, of breakdown, a problem in, in the communication situation. Nobody's ever had a problem translating. One, two, the women in red dresses. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. First of all, I cannot call it as a big problem for me, but it's something that I have thought about translation sector in Turkey. So for the thing that you said at the beginning of the seminar, you said that for somebody, uh, the more the connections, the agencies increase, uh, and the more the trust increases as well. No, reduce as you said. Yeah, uh, this is a moot point. This is what we're interested in. Well, in Turkey, I can say, depending on my own experiences as a freelance tra translator, I don't know for how many years, uh, the closer you get with people, I mean, uh, if you know the agency or the client by yourself, it starts well for the first one or two projects, so everything is okay, but then your relationships, your uh, professional relationships get somewhat disturbed. You begin to be paid later, and in the end, they never pay you. But if you are not that familiar, or you have just very mm, professional and distinct relations with your client, I mean, if you don't know each other really well, you just met somewhere, in this case, nothing happens. Everything goes really smoothly. And as Turkish people, it is usually hard for us to keep relationships at that point. So after a few projects, yeah, we, can, we usually become friends with that agency or client, and then we start to lose money. Wow. This is great because this disproves Christina Abdullah's model completely. She's saying the more we give, live in network societies, the less we can, we can use trust. You're saying the more personal we get, the less we're trusted. Uh, is this uh, I can say that the more personal we get, the more we get abused. I'm very sorry to hear that. I mean, I'm pleased it, dis it disproves the other model. Uh, but I know when I was doing this in Barcelona, uh, I would make a point of delivering large projects in person, really chatting with the boss, going to lunch with my clients, and working that, that aspect, really in order to build up thick personal trust, uh, which was necessary for me to keep getting good jobs. And okay. I can so give I don't know, is this, in there, this is, is it a Turkish thing? I guess so. I've Other never Turkish worked as translator abroad, just a few Italian sentences, that's it. But I can give an example for this. Mm. 
There was this guy, he owned a translation agency, he was doing really well. And a colleague introduced us and then we started working together. I only got interpreting jobs from him. And after some time he was a nice guy. I met his fiance, we became friends, we began to hang out. But she, she's met the fiance, become friends. It's getting dangerous, it's getting... <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we became friends with them. We started to hang out and one day he asked me, he had another agency, he opened another shop and asked me to help him there until he finds some qualified translator because at the same time I'm working at the university. I agreed and we agreed on a certain amount of salary and the last month he didn't pay my salary. Mm, okay, this does sound familiar. Anybody else got experience like that? The question is, does friendship, does thick trust, personal engagement help us or hinder us in our professional relations? Anybody else? In Turkey, you, you work in Turkey, are you online with people or do you know them personally? Most of the time I uh, met with my clients uh, and patrons of the agencies, but I prefer to keep a little bit distant from them so the, our interaction would be professional, yes. I guess. Yeah. The only time one of my agencies said, well, we're not working with you, so your work is not trustworthy, was the time when I said, well, I'm implementing mission translation into my work, so expect to yeah, better quality, and I'll receive, I'll send my translations, I don't know, 10 days before the due date, so check them out. If anything goes wrong, send them back to me and uh, they didn't accept it, and this, that was the point I, they, I lost trust of my client. Well, they lost trust with you? Yeah. Ah, because of machine translation. That, that's, that's really interesting. I'll come back to that in a minute, because that connects directly with the talk. Um, what you said there is very important. I know at some stage in my career, I got big projects in, like encyclopedias, and I had to hand out work, and I became a project manager. And, um, and I quickly learned not to mix business with friendship. That is, giving out work to friends and they do a bad job or it's late, etc. and I couldn't get angry with them, I couldn't cut them off because there's a friendship relation and you know, yeah, the fiancé and he knows my wife and all this stuff. Yeah, uh, so professional relationships, thick trust can be on the professional level but not in the all aspects of social life level. I've definitely had problems with that and learned from it that there is cordial, person-to-person, -person, professional relations which don't go beyond that. Why? Because you can psh, cut them off. You know, don't give them more work or cancel the contract or if, when it's necessary. Somebody has... Yeah. Okay, we find that this thin trust, this purely professional trust, actually works well. Yeah. And the thick trust doesn't work so well. Now that I think about it, it's because there's a kind of... What's chantaje? Esther Chantaki, um, you know, I can't break with this person because I know his wife and he knows my wife and I get into trouble at home if I do. It, sort of, it enters into your personal life where you can't make a business decision, all right? So there is some point at which that person-to-person -person trust can get too thick. Now, in history, I don't know. Andrea, working in early modern, uh, follows this through and says, you know, the translators were known in all social aspects. But do you find cases like that, Andrea, where because they're known so personally, they're very compromised in what they can do? Okay, so there was a sort of professionalism at work there, even within it. Okay, thank you very much for that. It corresponds with my experience, absolutely. Most of my good clients came through personal recommendation, but at a professional level. I, work for this guy, he works well. Not, you know, I know his wife or something like that. That's it. Uh, Just a very quick point about what we mean by friendship though. I mean, that's, yeah. I think there's a little bit of exploitation of what friendship means. It's a manipulation of friendship. It's not necessarily that you know you become friends in the sense that you go out and have meals together. I mean, is that, is that 
I don't think that that was what. Well, so except for the. I've been there. Yeah, I've worked. No, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, I mean, but, lunch with, but with I, my personal experience here is is about working for an Italian, uh, to translating articles for a big Italian publishing company, and my job started because I knew a, there was a friend of a friend who worked there, and. Um, and that created a sense, a false impression that we were friends. We sort of, you know, we knew each other really well, and so, and that created a sort of exploitation. It happens a lot, as far as I know, in Italy, where there's this sort of understanding that we we know each other, we're sort of part of the same group of friends. Then things can loosen up a bit. It doesn't matter if I pay you tomorrow or in five five weeks' time, in ten oh, yeah, years' oh, time, you're, it'll you're be lost. fine. It'll be then fine. And there's a big problem amongst professionals in general with that. That that um, freelance people they don't need to be paid uh, on time. So there's a cultural issue there that I think perhaps, it perhaps is more common in Southern Europe, I'm generalizing horribly, and, and I wonder what is that, thick trust? I'm not so sure that it is thick trust, that you describe those kind of relationships necessarily as getting to know each other a lot. It's more like exploiting uh, the exploiting uh, social relations, social relations uh, and creating a sense that that is a thick trust, but it's not. Can, there are quite a few cases can, like can I, that. Sorry, it, 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 it's me, Anthony. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I add a comment? I mean, going back in history, because I'd like to draw also Louise von Floto into um, into this talk, but I'm going backwards. I mean, I'm going back to, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the 18th century. Well, he's in early modern, he's real. So bad, it's yeah. a bit <laughs> after that then. Well, um, in the 18th, the 18th century, first of all, was the century of translation in Britain. Let's think about Alexander Pope translating Homer. How come, um, what, what, what was the position of women in this, in this century. Well, men used to translate classical, prestigious texts, and women translated from modern languages. But some of them were linguists. I've been working on Elizabeth Carter, and she used to work on 14 different languages. And she has, I mean, European languages, Italian as well, but she has Arabic, for example, I mean, languages which were not widely spoken at the time. But there was a clear-cut division in terms of gender. Women used to translate from modern languages because those works were not considered um, prestigious. In a way, they were responsible for contact, actually, between countries in which modern languages were spoken. So sorry for, I mean, that was a digression probably. No, no, so yeah. they were trusted? They personally. were trusted, they were trusted, trusted. But I have to say that they had not much choice, let's say. They couldn't tr translate from Latin or from Greek. Okay, but they would go looking for the text to translate or yes. knowing the authors personally. Knowing the authors, it's, that, that's pushing the, the argument a bit too far. Normally what happened, it was that booksellers selected the text to be translated. And when they decided to translate uh, from modern languages, they looked for women translators. Machine translation, it sounds like, to me like a case of asymmetric information. And when Alakoff did his classic paper on adverse selection, it's from a situation where it's assumed that the two people negotiating have different information. The guy selling the used car knows what's really inside it, and the guy buying it knows what his opportunity costs are. He knows the prices of the other cars around the street, and you negotiate on that basis. I know some things that you don't, you know some things I don't, and they lie to each other in the sense that they hide information. All right. Now this is classical situation for translators with clients and with readers, because we know what's in that text there, and we know the limits of our, our competence. We know there are things we don't understand. We know when we're winging it. We know when we're bluffing, and translators really do bluff a lot, uh, like used card buyers. <clears throat> okay? Now it seemed to me that when you went to the client and said, I'm using machine translation with this thing, 
You told them too much. You didn't, and they didn't know what you were doing with machine translation. I'm just guessing. So, you know, this word machine translation was thrown in there, and they understand error, high risk, don't trust it, down the drain with that job. Whereas you were just being honest, and you assumed you could have said post editing and made it sound fancy, but still, you'd have to dress it up in a way that makes the used car look like a good car. Okay? So, in the realm of technology, we are in the situation of asymmetric information. I was just talking about, in, in Melbourne, we're looking at uh, what kind of technology we should train translators in. And so one of my doctoral students has been interviewing the main translation companies. And we go into this great questionnaire about what technologies, and they are asking us, say, oh, what should we use? Oh, do you know of a good project management tool, et cetera? You know, we thought we were going there to the industry to find out what we have to train people for, not at all. They've got no idea, particularly in Melbourne there. And they're asking us, the university, for advice on what technology to use. So we were caught out by the situation of asymmetric information. And the weird thing is they were going to trust us. when well, we were quite prepared to trust them. OK? All right, so uh, translators working with technology, use asymmetric information to your advantage. Perhaps it's not good to tell everything. Actually, actually I like working with, uh, this is a project I did with two economists. So the modeling comes from classic, neoclassical economics. I found it really cool because everything in the ethics of communication, for us, or for Habermas, for example, is tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. The economists know we're lying all the time. It's accepted as part of social life. I found this quite liberating. Okay, yes. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Slovenia. Um, I, have an I had another type of uh, distrust. It was not uh, economical or so, but uh, uh, distrust in translational decisions. For example, I had a, a client, a commissioner, who wanted me to translate um, some theologian texts or, or a manual. And he was a theologian and also a linguist in Slovene language, but he wasn't a translator. And there were some terms. I was thinking about them and, you know, you um, consider all the, the elements and everything. And I decided for translation and he didn't agree and he didn't agree. And then I fought it for some time. And I said, at, at, at the end, I said, OK. You fought with? with I fought for my uh, solution. Ah. Uh, with the, because he, he wanted to have it uh, well done. And he also read the text. Was it a theologian term? Uh, Theological yeah, term? Yeah, it was. Um, I don't remember it exactly anymore, because it's some years ago. Uh, but I remember the situation. At the end, I, I said, OK, have it your way. But then, with the experience, more texts I translated, the more I saw the same, um, the same paradig paradigm, how do you call it, at other commissioners, they want to, to have their word in the, or the title or some terms, and I, I got more um, certainty in myself at, at, as a translator and in my decisions. And I also learned, at first, it irritated me, because also, afterwards, I, I could see I was right, sure. yeah, and I got more certainty and also I, I learned not to get so irritated but more to, to explain because mostly it's not, uh, they're not informed, they don't know the translational process, all the things you consider, uh, so this is my experience. You have to be very careful, oh, we're, we're not training you to be translators here, I'm interested in the nature of trust, okay? But what you're saying comes very, very close. Um, what you see developing in people over the, um, in master's training and then out when we get feedback out into the market is they grow in confidence in themselves. Uh, we live in a world of uncertainty. We know that many key translation decisions, there are always alternatives we could have selected. And part of our skill is making a choice very quickly and selling it. You know, just, this is it, and trust me, I'm the translator. Uh, and, and getting people to believe it, 
developing that confidence and making sure it has some basis in reality is one of the main tasks we have as, a, as, a, as trainers. On the other hand, I've done a lot of work with field experts and I've made clear mistakes because of limitations of my knowledge. Do you guys know what oats are? Have you ever had oats for breakfast? Or I have eaten oats for breakfast and I have harvested oats and I have worked in the Australia on sampling oats and I know what, they're itchy. Oats are not nice, but you know. So oats, O-A-T-S, right? And I was seeing this paper on oat. I've never seen oat. Have you seen oat, O-A-T? No, it doesn't exist. So I put an S because all my experience is oats with an S. And I give this to the client and he comes back and he says, what's this? And I said, oh, this is the way we say it. Crosses off the S. I'm talking about the oat plant called an oat. And I had to go and check it out. Quite right. I mean, we work with field experts and we do have to trust them. That's why I asked, is it a theological term? Yeah, because usually the other thing is uh, because we're making decisions in situations of great uncertainty, and sometimes they're high-risk decisions, uh, risk management has several things we can do. Take a risk. I think it's oats. I'm going to put oats and to hell with you. And I'm, yeah, I risk losing my client. It's a high-risk decision. All right? uh, the other thing you can do is risk transfer. You say, all right, you say it's oat. As long as you say it's oat and you're paying me, it's your problem. Okay? And you just, you, well, we do this all the time. We find an authoritative glossary, or we phone an expert, or we ask the client, and we get them to take the risk if something goes wrong down the line. So that risk transfer is something translators get very good at. And what I'm finding through going of, through lots of process studies, um, is that translators are terribly risk averse. Uh, if risk averse, they will avoid making a risky decision. So if you've got two terms, and one is, I mean, they, they're mutually exclusive, a good translator going very fast will tend to generalize. You find a superordinate. Okay, you, you won't be 100% right, but you won't be wrong. And, and translators learn to, to avoid risks and go very fast and keep their clients. Uh, using these risk aversion strategies or risk transfer with the client. So, hold on, you've had a go. Yes, please. Yeah, I wanted to um, bring up the issue again of, of the risk to translators of not getting paid. So, when I first started working as a freelance translator, I'm like, well, how can I trust the agency? How do I find out information? You're the man from finance, right? That's right, yeah. What did you do that for? <laughs> we don't get money. You've, you must be. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, because they're all very trustworthy in finance, right? <laughs> yes. So, you know, we live in, a, in an era of uh, fake news, and I, I just brought up, while we were talking here, an article uh, from the BBC News, which is called, Why I Write Fake Online Reviews. And the Consumer Association in the UK, which has been investigating this, and they find, like, a lot of the major online retailers, if you, go, if you want to buy a microphone online, and you read the online reviews, a lot of these reviews are actually fake. So what I'm interested in here is like the mean, you're talking about signaling, the means of signaling, so the, without naming them, the boards that are online. I started reading the reviews of the reviewers of the agencies saying things like, well, I remember seeing some really bad reviews of this particular language service provider or agency, and then miraculously, a couple of weeks later, they had disappeared. Ah. So yes. why is this? So what I'm interested in is like, who owns the power of the signaling mechanisms that get the information from those who provide the service to the clients and those who provide the translation? In other words, if I'm the provider of the signaling mechanism, the board, and I know I'm getting paid by these agencies to advertise jobs and you know, provide that mechanism, then my incentives might be biased towards not having negative reviews of language service providers. Sure. Um, so, so this issue of like sure. the ownership and control of the signaling mechanisms. Yeah. To, to make sure we're on the same page, uh, the signaling mechanism is like the sticker they put on the used car to say what's in there. <clears throat> so it, it used to be a degree was good enough 
used to be a long time ago, but actually most employers don't trust that degree. They have their own exams and tests, including the European Commission, by the way. Okay. Uh, so there's trouble in what signals. Now, signaling has moved to online reviews, as you said, for companies and for translators. It can happen in prose. You know how that works. You can signal your expertise by answering questions, you get kudos points and things, but you can also get negative reviews from clients and go down. Uh, the question then becomes, do we trust the reviewer? So the, the question of trust moves down to spot the false ones, spot the, spot the ones written by the company. And actually, not only that, but I also thought about what are the incentives, for, you know, I began asking myself, what about me? If they ask me to do a review of the agency, what are my incentives in doing a good review or a bad review? Because if I do a good review for the agency, then that will incentivize other translators to go and work for that agency. So my agency will now have more choice of translators, and maybe they'll choose to not choose me or yeah. pay me less. Or the translators go to that agency, get bitten, and they come back to you saying, you recommended them, and you lose this collegiality. That's another question for, for people who have been working as translators. Do we work collectively? Because I, I've been in situations where big projects, I need a team of translators, we have to work together. But then, freelancers are in competition with each other. And so are we going to lie to each other to, to get business? I've had occasions where people have taken a translation I've done, they've gone to the client, they've pointed out all these mistakes, and they've taken the client away from me. But their mistakes, as in, it's a real example, it was setting up business in Catalonia, and I said, the current edition, and the other guy said, oh, it should be the present edition. As far as I'm concerned, it'd be, you know, two things go, it's an uncertain thing. But red line all over, take the client away. Uh, so much for trust, so much for collegiality. Let me point out, with respect to the signaling mechanisms, this is going on um, in the translation world at the moment because of machine translation, because of the advances in neural machine translation Anybody can put a text through machine translation and sell it as a translation and get money for it if they have signals. So there are cases of people who will steal your online CV and credentials if you, ever you are stupid enough to put them online. This is a F ATA certificate. The certification from the ATA is worth money on the market because it's a rigorous exam, exam about 20% of the candidates actually pass. If you've got it, you can get more money. It's a signal that is, is, has market value. But the scammers can take your CV, take your name, take your, it's identity theft, okay, and um, deliver in your name a, um, a translation and ask the funds to be sent to their bank account. Okay, there's a, a website and a Facebook site called Scammers Direct, Translation Scammers Directory, and you will find a few thousand cases like this, of, and, and they name the people. Most of them, unfortunately, are in, for example, Pakistan and Gaza Strip, where there's not a hell of a lot of other things to do to make money. I can understand why people would go in and do this, because they have technological competence. But there is perturbation in the signaling mechanism, and so the, the message that gets around is don't trust the signals. If you want, you know, test your translator, and we find that we are being tested before we get any, any big or, or lucrative job. Yes? Oh. The purpose of this uh, internet page, uh, scammers directory, is to as a, as a warning or uh, yeah, yeah, to uh, to reveal. Okay. You know, to, you can check their name. They're all named there with the bank account numbers, you know, okay. which is the thing. You know, you know, why why for Mr. Shuao Ruan? Why am I sending it to a bank account in in the West Bank in Gaza? Wait a minute, uh, yeah. uh, Costanza. Uh, just something that came to me right now, right now, but it actually refers to what you were saying before. Sorry, I, I don't know your name. At the front, you were talking about mistrust. Um, 
uh, deriving from mm, the translator being honest about the tools he or she is being using, uh, she uses, um, in particular machine translation. So if you reveal that you use machine translation, you could be, uh, you know, uh, considered uh, source of errors, and not low quality, etc. Um, this uh, reminds me of something that the Italian Association for Interpreters and Translators did a couple of years ago. I, I, think, I think it's still um, valid today. They um, drew up a sort of uh, leaflet of about the make them, I don't know how to call it, about uh, what, the, what tr the translation work all entails in terms of tools used, uh, uh, competencies and uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that, uh, because they wanted to educate the clients, basically. So whenever they took a job, they signed a contract with uh, big commissioners, etc. they would also deliver uh, this sort of leaflet, this sort of uh, deontological code, whatever, or... Uh, description of what uh, the translator job all entails, including this new technology that maybe many uh, clients don't even know, in order to say, okay, this is what we do, we are professionals, uh, uh, this doesn't mean necessarily uh, low quality or whatever. I don't know if this can be a little solution towards, uh, you know, building trust between uh, parties that um, not, not always know about each other's uh, job, especially the clients don't know much about the translation, the translator's job. I don't know if they're still using it because this, this came out uh, at least uh, six, seven years ago. I, I don't know if, it had, if it's had any success or if it's still being used. I'm, I'm not informed about that, but um, it, it reminded me of a, you know, a possible um, way of building trust in some way. I don't know if it makes any sense or if, it's, uh, ex if it exists in any other countries. country. Sorry. There's a small booklet called Translation, Getting It Right. Yeah. It's written for clients. It's a guide to purchasing a translation. It was written by Chris Durbin. Uh, it's a little thing. It's been translated, I think, into 11 languages, including Italian, and it's translated by the main translation associations. So I actually counted up the members, and I think I found 25,000 translators have had this booklet available to them in their language to be used. Now, the booklet um, is written by a very successful professional translator. Chris Durbin runs a financial, well, she, she makes a lot of money out of translating company reports and budget statements and things like that for, in, in the financial sector. So very well paid, very prestigious very, very trusted. However, that booklet does say, um, always go to a human translator. But it was published in 2000, oh, look, uh, 2004 or something like that. But I mean, before the, the current avatars of machine translation. So it really is trust the human, don't trust the machine. It also says, and I cite, translation no, professors and students at your peril, which is where I get really upset because it's sort of assumed that people who teach translation and train translators, one, are not in the market, and two, don't know anything about the professional reality. Which is why Esther Torres and I did a survey of how many? 300 translation scholars. Nearly 400. And found that 94% have translated or interpreted regularly. That the teaching community does have professional experience, contrary to what's in the booklet. I got really upset about, about this opposition between professionals and academics. It really does upset me. It's like theory and practice. What a stupid opposition that is. Uh, we're all doing research. We're all creating and discovering knowledge in practice and in the university. And most unfortunately, because of university employment, many of our young teaching staff are obliged to be professional translators at the same time. Probably your experience as well. And I might add, those were my happiest years as a professional translator. Uh, working 50% for my clients, suffering, and, you know, and then talking about it in, in my classes where I get my students to solve the problems for me, as, as I'm doing now. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, so in my case, I'm a novice or junior 
a translator and I have this hard time gaining the trust of people or clients, you know, because basically the first thing they would ask about your experience. And although I agree that it's, um, you know, hard time, sometimes you find um, financial problems like in Turkey or in Italy, and maybe, I mean, I think that it's also a cultural thing um, that if you find, you know, if we get work through friends, sometimes, you know, you have this <laughs> problem of getting paid, but in my case, um, when you don't really have, you know, or you just have a couple of years of experience, it's the only way to get the trust of um, people that either a friend recommends me or I get work through a friend or a colleague or a teacher. Yeah, that's the only way. I Very think. good. Yeah. This is the, the eternal dilemma of entering a market when everybody asks for experience and you don't have experience. So here's the answer. Uh, technology. Every generation uses its technologies to get to the top. The previous generation, I was still translating with a typewriter when I began, hey? But I got an electronic typewriter and I got a little Mac and, and then I was in Barcelona and, um, and, and uh, I, I was one colleague at the university left city and handed me all these clients. It's just, you know, fr through personal contacts. What, uh, I'm really through a steep learning curve, uh, getting up to speed with all these clients. But I remember, this was the early days of, of uh, IT, of computers. I invested in a laser printer. It cost me a fortune. But I was the only guy around who had a laser printer. And I could deliver this really professional printout and stuff. I got so many clients, okay? What have you got? If you don't have experience, you have technology. So if I were young coming on the market now, I would know how to use those technologies to my advantage and use them to take work away from the Luddites in the previous generation like me, who, who, who used the technology to get to the top and then uh, denigrate all following technologies because you want to stay on top. It's an eternal generational cycle. And they're going to lose and you're going to win. So that's my recommendation, use technologies. Okay. What about personal recommendation? I, I, I found that all my best clients, all my best jobs came through personal recommendation. Never, never, you know, it's not somebody posts a job and you apply for it and you get it. Do you have experience in that? Yeah. That, that, that the trust, I mean, that person to person trust on a professional level has a great market value. Yeah. Yeah, I used to work this one other translation, translator from English to Turkish, and I attended some projects with him. And after some time, he had recommended me to some agency, a really good one in Ankara, in the capital. And it's been four years that I've been working with that agency without any problems, with pure trust on both sides, mm. and perfect payment. Good, that's the bottom line. Okay. Other situations requiring us to guess what happened? Esther. Uh, I think I'm going to share two which relate to the knowledge of languages our clients have. I work with Korean, and most of my clients have no clue whatsoever of the Korean language. So the situation was I was translating comic books, and at some point I received a uh, uh, a letter from the agency saying a client had complained about the translation because the French version didn't say the same. And the French was wrong. Um, so I had to argue with a client who had no knowledge of Korean that my translation was correct and the published translation in French wasn't. And although that was successful and they paid me and everything, it is true that client requested another translator for the future. Yep, sure. And the opposite is when, when the, the client has a good knowledge of the language, or he thinks he does. And I say he because in that case it was a man. And I was hired for translating tweets from Spanish into Catalan which are two languages which are very close to each other. 
So after a couple of submissions, the agency told me the client wasn't happy because in his opinion, the Spanish and the Catalan didn't look like enough. That I, I was accused of using too standard Catalan. And that for him, the Catalan he wanted to use was um, Barcelona's Catalan, which uh, steals many words from Spanish. And in that case, I was able to identify the problem. So for the, for the next tweets, I was just doing a, a bad translation uh, or, or not such a standard translation to make the client happy. And, that, and then um, as I kept on going, I started introducing again standard words, like real Catalan words, uh, until the client decided to discontinue the, the contract because it was, again, too Catalan. That's not, uh, to, to clarify, uh, people in Barcelona especially, there's a lot of code mixing because people go between languages and there's a continual struggle between official Catalan, which is the pure language, and Spanish, which is regarded as contamination. But in the street, people don't care. But you live in Barcelona, you could just translate into what you speak, surely. That would not go to... But it goes against the, the academic training that we have. Yeah? Uh, I mean, I don't speak the Catalan from Girona, so I don't have uh, a really... Um... Uh, no, traditional I mean, Catalan anyway, client wanted that but the client wanted it to be even less Catalan. I mean, to the point that the words I was using did not really exist. Yep. Uh, but the point, I mean, your client could have put it through machine translation very easily. Uh, Barcelona has uh, newspapers that are translated automatically every day because the languages are close enough for MT to work very, very well, okay, and got something. But the machine translation will be purist. It will translate everything and not put in those, those Spanish words. Machine translation does work to separate languages that socially uh, are very mixed. Is that unfair? Yes, um, I, 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 am, I, I just, I don't know, I had a laugh at it at the time. Although it was a, a really well paid job. If we calculate per word, it was an incredibly well paid job. There was not many words in a tweet. Yeah. Okay. And I was paid per tweet, not per word. Huh? Um, but I, I thought that the idea that, I mean, he, he believed he had a good knowledge of Catalan, but he did not want to translate it himself either, okay. which I thought was, yeah. because it was, a, it was for a brand, so he wanted to, the, the, the tweet to look. Okay. It reminds me, sorry, other stories to tell? Louise, yes, then I've got a story. I, I'm not, I came in a bit late. I don't know if you're talking just about freelance translation, but I have a, a, an incident that I'd like to mention that comes out of government translation. In Canada, translators are well-paid. Many translators are well-paid government employees who work between English and French and French and English, mainly. Two years ago, the Translation Bureau, which is a government institution, decided to supply government offices, the ministries, who have to work between English and French and between with English colleagues and French colleagues talking to each other, they decided to supply those ministries with translation machinery, a system to help them communicate inside the ministry in English and French. So if you want to write a, an email to your francophone colleague, and respect the fact that that person prefers to function in French, you run it through this machine system. The outcry was huge because it was felt that the translation machinery would produce poor French, thereby insulting the French language, thereby insulting the francophones of Canada, and it caused such an outcry. It hit the federal news, the system was dismantled immediately, the head of translation, the head of the translation bureau, a woman who had promoted this, was removed from her position and hidden away in some other ministry in it. And it was a really, really interesting political issue around, yeah, the trustworthiness and the, the value of machine translation and the, yeah, the importance what, to be assigned to it. What's interesting, Louise, is that mm -hmm. the our cry was on the French side and not the English side. 
Oh no, the English, they are... They, they don't care. The, no, they don't need to... <coughs> they don't bother with those details. You know, English well, we rules, don't have an, in a way. We, English speakers, we don't have an academy. Yeah. It's sort of an unregulated language that accepts yeah. lots of change quite happily, lots of tolerance. That's right. Whereas French is yeah. traditionally... But French in Canada has this, this very sensitive minority position that it, it fights and fights and fights every kind of uh, detail that can come up, and this caused an enormous, an enormous ruckus. I was the, at the time I was the head of uh, the School of Translation, and they wanted comments from me, and then they wanted they brought it into the international news that so Professor So and So uh, was promoting uh, French. The, the, mani the not even the manipulation, the, um, yeah, the destruction of the French language through machine translation. Did anybody look at the quality of machine translation between well, French and English? Well, one of the because comments was hard. that machines cannot translate it is raining cats and dogs into French. But nobody says that. I know. Only foreigners say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was the point of criticism. <laughs> okay, I bet, I bet Deepel will do it. If anybody's got a computer, run cats and dogs through Deepel. I bet they do. Okay, it's getting just that much better. Yes, please. Mine's not so much a story, but I'm pleased to hear you mention Deepel again. Um, one of the things I, I really love Deepel as somebody working with European languages, but I find that it is totally lacking once you get into the Asian market. It doesn't it, work. Doesn't in terms it. of machine translation suggestions for other um, outside the European language market, do you have any recommendations? I know you're talking about this kind of stuff on the weekend. Oh, good, well, well, for Chinese Baidu, uh, because they, 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 they're cleaning up the databases, but we've Sorry, compared which one was that? Baidu, B-A-I-D-U, but they comp we've compared that with Google, and in some cases Google is better, in some cases they're better. For Russian Yandex, uh, got to be careful though. Um, Oh, I'll get this wrong. Latvia has developed a very good, no, Estonia, I'm sorry, Estonia has developed a very good machine translation system between Estonian, English, and Russian. Okay? And, and it's online and it's free. And so this is technology at the service of the people. What it does, though, it means that they now publish all official documents from the government in Estonian only as saying to the Russian speakers, who are almost half the country, you've got the machine translation. Your language rights are covered. Okay? So there's this peculiar trade-off between what's been done in machine translation and the question of language rights, which if you might know in the context of the European Union, uh, we do defend the rights of those Russian speakers, as we would of Kurdish speakers were Turkey a part of the European Union, of, of significant minorities with the languages. And technology is being used to avoid that question. So there's a significant trade-off. Any other? Oh, we got all the big boys. No, 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 no you're, you're a legit student. student. Oh, I hope so. Uh, something which we've talked a little bit uh, about earlier this week was the issue of quality in terms of signaling feedback to translators. Because again, naively, when I started in the industry as a freelance translator, I thought I would get a lot of feedback on my work. But the reality is, as, as most of us probably know, you only ever hear back if there's a, bad, if there's yeah. a, if there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. And yet the standards say something like, and we talked about this as well, ISO 17100 seems to be mostly written from the point of view of language service providers. as Four a, companies, it's not four translators. Exactly, it? So, it, so it says something in there like, you know, it would be a nice idea if you as the language service provider would, would transfer the feedback that you got from your client mm -hmm. to you, which essentially means that you only hear back uh, when there's a problem. But to me, in an industry where, you know, for the younger translators in the room when they're starting, it seems to me in an industry where just a couple of generations ago you would have worked in-house with more senior translators and you would have gradually improved your skills by getting feedback from other people on how your translations could have improved in quality and that provides a signaling, signaling mechanism to how you could get paid more. That in now what we have which is like more or less a, you know, a cottage industry where we're all sitting at home in our pajamas translating if you don't get any feedback at all until there's a huge problem, there's, there's a signaling gap there in terms of quality, which then impinges on, on risk. Yeah, the, the feedback is you get another job from the client. 
<coughs> basically. <coughs> a couple of uh, things to comment on there. In the United Nations system, people will go in as translators, and for the first two years, they are not trusted. Uh, you work with a reviser. Everything you do is revised for two years, and you get constant feedback uh, to the extent that the research we did on what we should be training people for used all the feedback from the revisers to see what kinds of things our graduates were doing wrong. It's a very instructive about how you structure a master program if you've got fault analysis. Very unfashionable. Everybody else is doing competence analysis, but we can do error analysis, you know, gaps, things we have to fill. Uh, so that's the United Nations. They don't trust you until you've been vetted through this rite of passage of being hit over the head for two years. And then you know how to produce prose in the United Nations style. With, it's their whole style sheet that they're really worried about. By the way, their, their uh, intake requires no skills in translation technology at all for the simple reason they have their own in-house system. You're taught that on the job, which is fair enough. It makes sense. Okay. And, again, and again, just as a, as a kind of, because I always think, maybe from my financial background, I always think about the incentives to the, uh, uh, for the person giving the feedback. The agency that's working with me has got very little incentive to give me positive feedback anyway because it costs them time and money to do that. And if they give me good feedback, which I can then reuse, then that makes me more marketable to other agencies. They then potentially lose me a, as one of their translators. So they have a negative incentive to give me good feedback even when I'm doing a good job. Yeah. Uh, and they don't want you to identify the client or the, the client to identify you, which is a problem in the market as well. Other people? Uh, was it Esther, did you have something? No, no, David, David, yes. Uh, well, actually, what I've got is an email exchange between a translator, editor, commissioner, and original author, which you could comment on, but it'd be easier for me to just show it up there. Uh, maybe you could take another question while I... Do that. Off, off you go. I'll comment on when I lost trust. Uh, this is when I made a mistake. I remember my daughter, who's now 28, was two, age two, in, in the office, thro throwing paper all over the place. So it was a long time ago. And I do remember there was a city of 5,000 people, and I translated it as 5 million, because it's mil in Spanish, and mil million. Not paying attention. Right? And there were three things like that in this report of 50 pages. Not high-risk parts of the report, because the good thing about machine translation used to be when it's wrong, it's really wrong, and if it's 5 million and it should be 5,000, anybody will see that's a mistake. So, however, my client picked up on these three things, decided I hadn't done it myself because she was used to everything being perfect, this was before my two-year-old was messing around in my office while I was trying to translate, and uh, revise the text. People who work into English, one of the problems we have is that everybody knows a bit of English, or they think they do. And so the report of 50 pages got, I think I did count, 64 new errors added to it, at which stage I lost complete trust in my client. Trust works both ways. I said, if you think you're going to publish that, off you go, and uh, don't come back to me. I was so happy, two years later, she came back, usually in August, when the, nobody had, no, no other translator would possibly work in August, and I could say, no, thank you. Okay, you, you lose trust, and if you don't have that trust relationship with the client, if they're going to correct your work, forget about it. It's your work that's going to be messed up. Okay, so feedback, yeah, it's negative, but positive feedback, it's, it's a world of uncertainty. Are they sure? Okay, how are you going? Yeah, I think we're David, yeah. Um, okay, so what we have here is uh, an email from a friend of mine who is a uh, Italian English translator. She's got 35 years of experience, uh, and there are other credentials there. So, in theory, she has that level of trust of the person who can provide the right translation. And she wrote me an email that began, use of the effing historical present in Italian. And it was a question over verb tense. So she was translating book translations and she's tearing her hair out. And this is what the problem was. Uh, this is the Italian. 
And so, sorry, effing is a technical term here, is it? Yeah, for fucking, yes. Thank you. So, the Italian is about uh, Turgid, and it's basically her story in the past. So, Juliet, that's her name, uh, wrote, Turgid had, then became, she graduated. No real problems. What came back was the correction, Turgid has, which is possible. The historical present exists. But it's not what the translator thought was the best, and it's certainly not the most frequent, common use of the, uh, of the historical present. But of course it is in Italian. And this was the problem. So the translator wrote to the commissioning editor and wrote, Hi, commissioning editor, in response to your letter, read the chapter, I've noted the comments about, and they were stylistic and so on. However, the use of the present tense to indicate an event that took part in the past are more tricky. And this is where it gets really interesting, because she says, I need to make it clear from the start that I want to do my utmost to produce a good translation. It's also proofread, proofread by another. And so Juliet is saying, I am the translator and I will produce the best translation. So the publishers then sorry, the Italian commissioning editors then wrote to the English publishers. And they wrote this. Hi, and I added, trusted publisher. How are you? We would like your advice on the translation of the book. While the author uses the historical present tense, our translator is using the past. <laughs> but... So we had this battle between the original author, who clearly understands English and believes she could do a better job, the translator who's got 35 years of experience. The commissioners go, we don't know. We'll send it to the people we really trust, who are the commissioning, uh, to the publishers. Thankfully, the publishers wrote back, um, oh, this is yes. Could you read the two attached and tell us, give us your advice? So you are the people to be trusted. <clears throat> the editor translator wrote back, writing to not really trusted translator, I'm sending the response of our publisher. The publisher said, yes, we prefer the past in line with the translator. And we've, edit, uh, we've discussed it with the highly trusted author. And this is the interesting thing. The author who commissioned the work to be translated into English is the person who's still more trusted than the person who is trusted to do the work. And she agrees, as you had suggested. She, pre she appreciates this is the original author, all the work and thought you're putting into the book, and would like to continue the translation, of course. Um, comments? So, the, the author has, makes the call in the end. The author, because the publishers, said that they preferred using the past. Yeah. So the publishers wrote back to the original author, at which point the original author went, OK. OK, yeah, that's good. Who's paying? Who? Who pays? I mean, the money. Um, the commissioners pay. And they ah. threw their arms up and said, OK, we don't know. We hear the original author is making a big noise. And so we're stopping the translator for the moment. But the author changed opinion, is that right? Yes. Good. So but not thanks her? to the translator. Yeah. So the author eventually trusted the translator? Uh, no. No. Oh. The author translated the publisher. Trusted the publisher? Not the translator. Yeah. Well, it's money. Mm. The person who pays... The risk transfer would, would just say, you know, if you're stupid enough to want the present tense, good, off you go. Or find another translator who'll do it mm. for you, which is your other your other call. But so. this is I mean this was good money for the translator. At the same time, she was very convinced that she would not cede and not agree to what she felt wasn't the right. Way yeah, to I do could things. see her point, but And she won in the end, but only because somebody else who had the power made that decision, not the translator. It, it's a nice example because it's so typical of, of, of the juicy translation decisions when it's not right or wrong. 
it's right, 80% right, 70% right, and there's, there are all these things that could be done according to certain situations. I mean, it could be the, pre the historical present and, and it, the, whole, the project wouldn't flounder. Yeah. But perhaps as a translator, I've become um, less close to alternatives. Tolerance of ambiguity is yeah. a term. I, I get to the point, if you want that, all right, who yeah. cares? Yeah? But your translator perhaps was not being as tolerant of ambiguity as she could be. Yeah. Thank you. Is that from a course that you teach something, David, or where does this come from? Well, Louisa says we intervene all the time. We translate. Yeah, we are. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. This book that I mentioned that I'm translating from German to English about an autofiction about bipolar disorder. A uh, young a man who, who has suffered bipolar disorder writes about it very, very, uh, in very literary terms. And at one point, describes how in a moment of, of ongoing manic madness, um, how sex plays an important role for the manic. The manic is constantly going after women, and he lists the women that, that he has encountered. And, and that he goes in search of and just picks them up like this. And in German he says, with reference to one of them, um, she responds to his sexual activities by saying, ist das Übung oder was? I translated it as, are you practicing or what? And he is revising my translation and he said, oh, this is a sensitive point. What I actually wanted her to say is, did you take training? Are you so good? Was it, uh, did you take a course or something? Has to feel geübt, uh, you know, in the It in, could be that, but no. And, yeah. and he said, but then his comment was, well, mm, maybe the translation is right after all. And it was, it was a really interesting problem of my understanding it in one way, and wanting probably subconsciously to, to you know, get rid of some of this uh, uh, masculine prowess that he's trying to, to uh, uh, describe there, or evoke, he doesn't describe it, he just... Uh. And on the other hand, him having understood it completely different, but being willing to take my uh, to accept my, my translation as well, my interpretation, really. That's a wonderful example. Yeah, really So he wanted it to be something like, you've been training. Yeah. So you're gonna walk. <laughs> yeah. So okay. now I haven't finalized the translation. I don't know whether to put, did you take a course or has, have you been through a training <laughs> session or what, to be so good. But he doesn't, there, nowhere is it, nowhere does he say, to, she doesn't say, oh, you're so good. She just says, is das Übung oder was? Very ambiguous, isn't it? It's, but yeah, I totally mean, there ambiguous. are many ways you can take yeah. it. Yeah. And if I were translating without, I mean, I, look, to make money, I, I learned to go very fast. I would be literal and yeah. risk aversion. You know, let the reader sort it out or let the author modify it if they really but want But I think, I think this exercise of having the author respond, at least this author, and his, his English is very good because he's done a master's uh, in some American university in, in English Lit and so on, um, is really useful, really, really helpful. I think some of, maybe the example from Italy, um, uh, the problem is that many people think they know English, but they don't. Or they yeah. don't know the details. They don't know that stories are told in the simple past and not in the, in the historic present, right? And, and so that, I think that kind of... Um... The, the historical present, I mean, it's easy enough to tell them to go and look at Harry Potter or, or Dan Brown or you know, pick up a novel in English and see what it's written in. I mean, that's, we can use some evidence to justify yeah. a decision. This one, though, is very tricky. It's yeah. rather more typical of the kinds of things we do get. I, I like that feedback. I think it's good to have the feedback, provided it's from a knowledgeable person and a person who's flexible. Ochala. Yeah, I ochala. Mean, <laughs> in the best of cases, but my professional experience <laughs> suggests that is quite rare. Uh, I've won 
comment. Uh, any other stories? Because, I mean, you've got all the experience. Yes, please, you haven't had it. Yeah. A comment about what you said that uh, people sometimes, for example, they think they know English, so they think they know more than you. But I think that happens with everything that has to do with language because we all use language. So we all think that we know things about language. I mean, I wouldn't contradict a doctor about something about medicine because I don't know. But we all use language. So for example, my, my parents and I am from Leon in Spain. So we, are, we use uh, the inst la instead of le for the pronoun. So when I say my father, for example, oh no, you don't say uh, la regalo un vestido, for example, you have to say le. You say, oh, that doesn't sound right. You know, like he knows more because yeah, for him, he, that doesn't sound right, so he doesn't believe me. Even though I have been studying Spanish language for a long, long time, so he thinks he knows more than I do because he uses languages every day. Well, so he I is right. It, <laughs> in, in his domain, he is but, right. I mean, that's right. So I think it's, it has to do with the fact that we use language, so we are entitled to have an opinion about language because we use it. Language is very democratic. We vote every time we speak. Yeah. Okay. It's one story to pick up on the clients. Yeah, this is okay, I think. Cause I used to translate for the president of Catalonia, who was Jordi Pujol, Mr. will remember. Uh, right-wing, independentist politician, but a very, very clever politician. And his, uh, I would do his speeches, uh, which were then published and for the interpreters, okay? And, and I, I started off trying to make them logical, I thought, trying to make them English with linear logic, like there's A, B, and then C, you know, syllogism, for example. And, and I would work tremendously on this text, organizing it. And then the feedback came was, that's not the way he presented it. I said, well, nobody can follow this on the written page. And um, his, um, his English was minimal. His German was very good, by the way. And um, uh, you go through it. And, and eventually, he just convinced me. I could see it was not that it was wrong. It was just taking up too much of my effort to do this. And I got to the point what all right, if that's what he wants, and if it's taking all my time to do this, I'll just give it to them the way it is. And I went down and did very literal, straight translations of what it was for. And I remember this was a campaign for him to be elected to some European position, the European Association of Regents, something like that, and with a speech or something. I thought, you'll never get elected. He got elected. I mean, at the end of the day, some people are good at being politicians and others are good at being translators, but you've got to recognize they know what they're doing. They, they know their job. And I have to get him to trust me, but also I have to trust their skills and give away a bit of the correctness that I think I control. Yeah. So there are situations like that. The effort is also the key thing. Uh, many of us are working far too hard, especially academic translators. We have. We think we have time to invest in these texts. Often the texts are not worth our best efforts. Yes, yes, please. There you go. There's a, in terms of effort, there's a very interesting theory. I can't remember who's it by, but my friends keep reminding me of this every time I complain that my translations are terrible. That, yeah, but I'm like, ah, oh, I've just handed in something. It's awful, I don't like it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this theory is the 80-20 theory, so that you sh the time it takes you, oh wait, I need to explain this well, um, so you can get to 80% of your quality, and then the time it would take you to bridge that last 20% gap to get to 100% quality is not worth it, and no one will notice it. No one will notice the difference. For me, as a translator, it's really difficult to accept because I know that there is a gap. But I am starting to see that it's more difficult to acknowledge from the outside. And I can, I'll find it better explained because I'm not able to relay this properly because I don't comprehend, <laughs> like I can't accept it, but... Um. Oh, it rings very true to me. It's, it's good enough theory. I mean the perfect translation, the perfect text doesn't exist, or linguistic perfection doesn't exist. 
but good enough for the purpose. It was a big step forward when the European Commission, or the DGT, uh, accepted, accepted uh, for, fit for purpose translation, good enough for this purpose, okay? Because that 20%, although, where's, where's the European Commission translator? One of, that's you. You're paid well enough to get that 20%. <laughs> you should get right, right. Most of us outside that sort of uh, salary bracket uh, live perpetually. But the nature of translation is indeterminate. We are constantly in front of decisions where there is no correct answer. There's possible, many possible answers, and we have to bet on them, and we have to bet quickly, and we usually bet conservatively. We tend not to take risks. Oh, on the European, because I have them up there, because I did go through the, the, the South African minimal you know, zero trust, uh, European translators, can you tell us how much they are paid? Uh, well, it depends on your years of experience, but the salaries are public. If you look it up online, the brackets are public. I think the base salary, uh, if you're an official, a permanent official, is 4,000 something a month, 4,000 euros a month. Is that all? I thought, I thought you were going up Well, it goes way up. Well, yeah, yeah, it goes okay. way up. If right. you get in, you need a bachelor to pass the, uh, the competition. Yep, you don't uh, have to be trained as a translator? No, you need no, a no. bachelor degree Better in something. Better if not, if you haven't been contaminated by... <laughs> yeah. Or if you have other... Like, a degree in something else yeah, is actually... Very, that's way, actually a very really good point. Really useful. Very interesting, yeah. Um, and then if you have just a bachelor and no other experience, you're basically, you go in at step one of the lowest uh, official level, which is 85 for officials. And it should be 4,300, but I can't, I'm not sure. Oh, but if you look it up. At the end of career, they're getting much, much more than me. You do, you just don't pay tax, you pay taxes straight to the EU, uh, and you don't pay taxes in the country you live in. And, and you get your kids to go to a European school where the teachers are paid twice what normal teachers are paid. Anyway, anyway, you guys should give perfect translations. And no, yet. But, no, but it's, it's humanly impossible. But there is this trust thing. By paying you high salaries, you are faithful to the institution. Yeah. It's like German professors, Louisa, well, no, German full professors are paid a lot of money. But it was Bismarck who introduced it because he recognized he needed the intelligentsia on the side of the regime. And I've had colleagues there in Germany who, who follow that. You know, we are supposed to be here to support Germany. The high salary has its role. It buys trust, buys loyalty in many cases. And it attracts, or it's supposed to attract. Have you ever, has it occurred to you in the English section, okay, the people who work with English, who are these days doing a lot of revising more than, more than actual translating. How many come from Oxford and Cambridge? I, I, no? I might be wrong, but the ones I know from the unit, none of them. Ah, okay. Because certainly the interpreters are wonderful. But different. Yeah. Um... Because interpreting, they are very, very good. But they have this superb RP accent. So whatever they were saying, you're going to trust it because it sounds right. Okay, and that formal quality creates trustworthiness, which is what we're buying. I yeah. think the formal quality is a very relevant aspect even for translation, especially legal translation into Italian, where we're so used to certain structures. And the more complicated, the better quality, because the Italian legal and technical language is very Baroque. Uh, and that's actually an ongoing discussion. Versus, in David, so. didn't you, years ago we talked about kiss versus kilt? English is keep it short and sweet, and Italian is? Common, long and keep it long and complex, <laughs> okay. Other stories to tell? If not, we could call it a day. One more, yes, please. Sorry, I've got another question rather than a story, if that's okay. Hmm. Ethics and machine translation. I've been concerned hearing in various forums people saying that it's unethical to use machine translation because it breaches confidentiality of our clients. 
I personally are of the opinion that we have confidentiality. Ah, good question, yeah. Um, if you're obviously using Google Translate on the internet, you would be putting it in the public domain. However, with um, API requirements with MT, within CAT tools, you normally would have a confidentiality agreement with your MT provider. I was looking for your comments on yep. how you feel. Uh, I get my students in class because I teach them various tools and I do get them to check the text, the disclaimers about confidentiality. And it's true that Google has some slippery little phrase there, which basically says anything you upload, they own. The public one, but not in... In Google so Translator Toolkit as well. The Cloud Translate actually says they will not use your data for... Okay, anything. but it doesn't mean they haven't got it. Yeah, they've got it. Yeah, they, yep. they've got it. I mean, yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah. Uh, and the other ones... Uh, Make, Matecat and Wordfast will make promises, but they've got it in their database because they're interested in improving their database, so they want the results of your translation. I would say the CAT tools, not necessarily, because they're off-site. Like, for instance, my CAT tools are on my C no, drive, so they don't have it. Versions. But the MT, if, if web-based versions, training, absolutely. We've got so many Macs, and the tools don't exist for Macs, so we use exclusively web-based solutions, which absolutely. means your translation's going off. Anyway. Any online web tools and any um, free MT, I would definitely consider to be at risk. Yeah, but I sure. would not consider personally that the use of MT breaches confidentiality as a whole, depending on your setup. You've got to check it with your client if they know what's going on. Uh, two things that, that occurred to me. Um, at the very beginning of online uh, translation memory systems, it was, was um, a debate about who owns the memory. Do you remember that this is in the 1990s when you do a translation and you deliver the translation to your client and then the client says, can you give me the memory as well? Because the memory is used to build up the translation memories and, and it, there's this thing, but it's, I produce this, do I sell it as another product or is it mine and can I keep it and build up my own memory? Because all of us wanted our own memories to be built up. And there's this debate about ownership of translation memories. And that was solved by technology. Specifically, uh, Lionbridge had Logoport, which, which it obliged all its translators to use. And that meant as soon as you translated on this web-based system, they got it. There was no way a translator could own their translation memory. It was automatically taken away from them. And we've lived with that ever since, that perpetual robbery, stealing of our work. Uh, going into translation memories, and I assume the systems are doing that in order to build up the, the, the translation memories. The other thing is that the future, I think, is fairly clear to me. It comes from IBM. Remember IBM, that big company? Uh, it has always had machine translation there. It's always used it, but it's been uh, quite different. IBM has a machine translation system for each of its products. So the product is developed, it's sold in many languages, and they develop a machine translation basis for that which is used in-house. What this means is that uh, it, the machine translation system is highly clean, very product specific, and operates like a big translation memory. So the two technologies come together. It also means that this is a system you can develop in-house. So I really think the future is that each company will have its own in-house machine translation system, often very specific for different products or range of products. And it's not difficult to build. Lots of people use Moses, it's free online, you can develop your own machine translation system. So that will solve the confidentiality problem. Do it yourself, machine translation. Anyway, that's a prediction. Anyone else? Good, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.